Hello everyone, today we're going to be going over all of section 3 from uh, SAT practice test number 9. This is the no calculator math section. 20 questions, 25 minutes, let's do it. Starting off with number 1. Uh, we're solving the system of equations above 4x plus y, so uh, the fastest way we can do this is just to combine these two equations. Right, so we're going to add them, we're going to get that 3x plus y is equal to 12, and now we know that y is equal to 12 minus 3x. Right, so uh, we just combined them in a way that gave us one variable. Now that we know what y is, we can just plug uh, this in for um, for y, right? So we'll plug it in right here. So we know that x plus uh, y, which is twelve minus three x, so two times twelve minus three x. Rather, x plus twenty four minus six x is equal to four, right? Uh, x minus uh, 6x is, is going to be negative 5x, so negative 5x plus 24 is equal to 4. Negative 5x, subtract 24 from both sides, uh, is equal to negative 20, so x has to equal to 4, right? Divide both sides by negative 5. Negative 20 divided by negative 5 is 4. So we know that x is equal to 4. Now let's solve for y. If x is equal to 4, let's just plug this in here. So we know that 4 plus 2y is equal to 4. Uh, subtract 4 from both sides. We know that 2y is equal to 0. Uh, 0 over 2 is equal to 0, so y is equal to 0. So, if we know that x is 4 and y is 0, uh, 0 plus 4 is equal to 4. Moving on to number 2, it says which of the following is equivalent to this? Literally, just combine like terms. First thing we're going to do is we're going to distribute. 2 times x squared is 2x squared. 2 times negative x is negative 2x. Now we're going to add this to 3 times x squared, so 3x squared and uh, 3 times negative x, which is negative 3x, right? So here we have 5x squared minus 5x, 5x squared minus 5x. Moving on to number 3, it says, the which of the following statements is true about the graph of the equation 2y minus 3x is equal to negative 4 in the xy plane, right? So here we have this, and it's a really weird format. Uh, usually, uh, in order for us to tell the slope and the y-intercept, we need it to be in y-intercept form, which is y is equal to mx plus b where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. So all we have to do is just rewrite it as such. So 2y minus 3x is equal to negative 4. Let's just rewrite that. So here uh, we have 2y uh, is equal to negative 4 plus 3x, or 3x minus 4 is equal to 2y. Remember, we can just rewrite that as that. Now we have y is equal to 3 over 2x minus 2, right? So. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us that we have a positive slope, so we can eliminate a and b. And this tells us that we have a negative y-intercept because our y-intercept is negative 2. So the answer is d. Moving on to 4, it says the front of a roller coaster car is at the bottom of a hill and is 15 feet above the ground. If the front of the roller coaster rises at a constant rate of 8 feet per second, which of the following gives uh, the height in feet for the front of the roller coaster car as seconds after it starts the hill? Uh, this is, of course, a, uh, it's asking us for the equation. It says that uh, it rises at a constant rate. So whenever we have a constant rate, we're going to think linear. And whenever we think linear, we're going to think of y equals mx plus b because this is the formula for a linear line. Um, so it, it's asking us for the following gives us h in feet, which is going to be here. So we have h is equal to m times s seconds plus uh, b feet, right? So if we start 15 feet above the ground, if we start 15 feet above the ground, that means our y-intercept, or our initial value, is going to be 15. If we rise at a constant rate of 8 feet per second, that means that our slope has to be 8. So here we have 8s. And h has to equal to 8s plus 15. Uh, 8s plus 15. So cho choice A. Moving on to um, number 5, it says the equation above gives the amount of C dollars in an electricity charges for a job that takes H hours. Miss Sanchez and Ms. Mr. Roland each hire this electrician. The electrician works two hours longer on Miss Sanchez's job than on Mr. Roland's job. How much more did the electrician charge, right? So um, both of them, there's an initial charge of 125, right? So no matter how, how long they work for, uh, there, he's going to charge them $125. We know this because $125 is not multiplied by any uh, measure of time, right? The only value that's measured by time is 75H, which means that every hour he works for, uh, he charges them $75. $125 he's always going to charge, right? So we're only looking at the 75H, 
right? So if you work two hours longer on Miss Santos's job, this age is always going to be two greater. In other words, uh, 75 times two is going to be 150. So no matter what this age is, if I work two hours longer, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, he, I'm going to end up costing $150 more, which is choice uh, C, right? So it doesn't matter if, if the electrician worked four hours, uh, for, uh, Miss Sanchez, uh, sorry for Mr. Roland and then six hours for Miss Sanchez. It doesn't matter. This is still two hours greater. And because it's two hours greater, it's going to be $150 greater because $75 per hour times two extra hours is $150. Going on to number six, it says the circle above has center O. The length arc ADC is 5 pi and X is equal to 100. What is the length of ABC, right? So whenever we have one of these questions, we're going to set up a proportion. We know that X is 100 degrees. And we know that this whole thing is 360 degrees, right? So look at what we can do. We know that when X is 100 degrees... 100 degrees corresponds to 5 pi, right? So this area, or rather the length of arc ADC is 5 pi. So when we have an X value of 100, we know that this is 5 pi. But we know that there's 360 degrees inside of a circle. We know that when we have 100 degrees, we have an arc length of 5 pi. What happens when we have an arc length of 360 degrees? How many pi is that, right? That's what we're asking here. So this uh, A, B, C, A, B, C is right there. So let's just set up this proportion. We have 360 times 5 pi has to equal to 100 times X, right? So uh, 360 um, times 5 is going to give you 0, 0, 3, 1, 8. So you have 100 uh, pi is equal to 100 X. We're going to subtract uh, 100 on both sides. And we're left at 18 pi is equal to 360. Or rather, that 18 pi... Uh, um, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm, I'm really uh, blanking on this. Uh, is equal to x, right? So when we have 360 degrees, the, the, the length of this full circle, the length of this full circle, all 360 degrees of the circle is going to be equal to 18 pi, right? So they're asking us for a, b, c, which we don't know, but we know that this is 5 pi. So what we can do is eight, five pi minus five, uh, 18 pi minus 5 pi, which gives us 13 pi, right? So all we did was we set up a proportion to find the total length of this whole circle, right? We're trying to find this section, and we know the total, and we know that this is 5 pi. So in order to get this section right here, all we have to do is subtract the total, which is 18 from 5. Moving on to number seven, it says if eight over X is equal to 160, what is the value of X? Uh, this is once again, another proportion. Eight over X is equal to 160 over one. Eight is equal to 160 X. So eight divided by 160 is equal to X. You know that this is going to give you a decimal because you have a smaller number over a bigger number. All of the other ones are wrong because they give you bigger numbers. Uh, so yeah, you don't even need to divide. You can already tell. Uh, why can you tell is because whenever you have a smaller number over a bigger number, you're going to get a decimal. So moving on to number eight, it says in the equation above, A is constant. If no value of X satisfies the equation, what is the value of A? Uh, so pretty much, uh, notice how this is what is, this is in Y equals MX plus B form, right? Here's our M. So our M is 2A, that's our slope, and our B is negative 15. Whenever we're dealing with, uh, no solution, right, or no value of X satisfies the equation, we're dealing with two parallel lines. That's always, that's just how the SAT functions, right? If that means that if they has no solutions, that means that they never touch. And the only type of line that never touches are, are, par are parallel lines, right? We know that nothing here is going to be squared. So we're not dealing with quadratics. So they have to be two parallel lines, which means that they have to have the same slope. So here, our, our slope on this side is 2a. And we need to find their slope on this side. So let's do that. So here we have 2ax minus 15. This is this is our y equals mx plus b for one of the lines. And this has to be equal to 3 times x plus 5 plus 5x minus 1. Right? So what's that? 3 times x is 3x plus 15 plus 5 times x is 5x minus 5. So here we have 8x plus 10 is equal to 2ax minus 15. Right? So remember that they have to have the same slope but different y-intercept, right? Because if they have the same y-intercept, that means that it's the same line. 
so these two lines have the same slope, but obviously they intercept the y-axis at two different points. So if they have the same slope, the slope here is 2a. So 2a has to equal to the slope here, which is 8. So 2a is equal to 8. a has to equal to 4. Uh, moving on to number 9. Right. Uh, sorry about that. Pause. <sighs> so moving on to number nine, it says the system of three of three equations is graphed in the XY plane above. How many solutions does the system have? I was just talking about solutions. It's almost like this. They're, they're grouping the questions based on topics. Solutions equals to intersections equals intersections. Right. So there are three different lines. So a solution would be a point where all three of these lines intersect. And that's going to be this point right here, which is which means that uh, there's only one point of intersection, right? This line is going to go down here, and it's going to intersect this line and this line at this point, and then it's never ever ever going to touch this line ever again, right? This there's only one point where all, where they all touch each other, and it's uh, that point, right? So the answer is one point, right? So moving on to number ten, it says the equations about uh, the equation above is true for all x where a and b are constant, right? So we know if it's true for all x that these are the same line. So these two have to be the same line, but they're just expressed in different terms, right? This is just a factored out version of this. And we're trying to solve for AB. So the only way that we can solve for AB is either factoring something out here and matching those values or expanding it and matching the coefficient values. I'll show you what I mean in a second, right? So the first thing I'm going to do to solve this problem is to expand this, right? I'm going to multiply AX times 5X squared. I'm going to get uh, A times 5X cubed, right? Next, I'm going to multiply AX by negative bx, I'm going to get uh, a, uh, sorry, I'm going to get minus a b x squared. Next, I'm going to uh, multiply a x plus four, and that's going to give me plus four a x, right? Next, I'm going to move on to the to my three, right? So uh, over here, I'm going to start multiplying by this three. So positive three times five x squared is plus 15 x squared. Positive three times negative bx is negative three b x. And here we have plus 12, right? And we know that this equation has to be equal to this equation, right? This has to be equal to 20x cubed minus 9x squared minus 2x plus 12. It just has to be equal to this because for all, all x means that they're the same line, right? So this is the same line, but we're just hiding some of these coefficients with variables, right? So for example, in order for this to be the same line, the coefficients have to equal the same thing. So a times 5x cubed, whatever this a value has to be, it has to give us 20x cubed, right? So if a times 5x cubed has to equal to 20 times x cubed, right? Or 5a times x cubed is equal to 20 times x cubed, a has to equal to 4, right? Because when a is 4, right? when a is equal to four, uh, this makes, uh, when it's multiplied by five, that that's equal to 20 x cubed, right? So we only know what a is. Now we just need to solve what b is, right? So a is equal to five. We need to solve what b is. So uh, the next thing uh, that, that we should probably do is we should uh, look at this negative a, b, x, right? Or this negative a, b, x squared. We know that negative a, b, x squared plus 15 x squared has to equal to negative nine x squared, right? So let's just simply solve for this. Uh, let's add nine x squared on both sides, nine x squared on both sides. Uh, what's 15 plus nine? 15 plus nine is probably gonna be 24. Four, one, two, yeah, I was right, it's 24. So here we have 24 x squared. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I wrote that on the wrong side. So here we have uh, uh, negative a b x squared is equal, uh, sorry, oh my God. Sorry, it's, it's uh, 11.50 when I'm making this. So negative abx squared plus 24x squared is equal to zero. So now I could add abx squared on both sides. So I have 24x squared is equal to um, abx squared. And really what I just realized, uh, so, um, so we know that a is equal to five. But really, we don't even need to know what a is because we could just we could factor out x or we can divide both sides by x squared. And we know that a b is really equal to 24. Right. So realistically, I just figured out a way to do this quicker in actually doing it. But really, uh, the method would have still been the same. You would have had to plug in a is equal to five for that. You would have solved for b and then you would have multiplied your a value by your b value. Right. 
uh, you would have gotten that b is equal to 24 over 5, and 24 over 5 times 5, which is our a value, would give you 24. So in other words, literally just match up the coefficients, match up the things in front of the variables and solve directly. All right, so which of the following represents all possible values of x that satisfy the equation uh, above, right? So which, which values of x uh, would make this situation true? So let's solve for that. So if you have x over x minus 3 is equal to 2x over 2, once again, another proportion. So we could just cross multiply to solve. 2 times x is 2x, and this has to be equal to 2x times x minus 3. In other words, 2x has to equal to, to 2x times x, which is 2x squared, uh, minus 2x times negative 3, which is 6x, right? So let's just combine like terms. Um, 0 has to equal to 2x squared minus 6x minus 2x, so 0 has to equal to 2x squared minus 8x. What's happening next? Well, we have to solve for a value of x that satisfies, so we could just factor out x, take out x, we get 2x minus 8, right? So what satisfies this? Well, obviously when x is equal to 0 satisfies this, right? x is equal to 0 satisfies this because anything times 0 is 0. If I plug in zero, uh, x as 0, 0 is equal to 0 times negative 8. 0 times negative 8 is 0, that makes sense, right? So x can be 0, or... Uh, whatever's in this parenthesis can be zero. So whatever outside the parentheses can be zero. We already solved for that, but whatever is inside also has to be zero. So 2x minus eight has to equal to zero as well. Uh, so we can, uh, sorry, it has to be zero. So we can just add eight on both sides. 2x has to equal to eight, so x has to equal to four. So uh, this is true when x is either zero or when x is four. These two values would make this whole thing equal to zero. So answer has to be zero and four. Moving on to 12, it says, which of the following expressions is equivalent to the expression above for uh, x is greater than zero, right? So whenever you have which of the following is equivalent to the expression, we're just asking you to rewrite this in a new way. Uh, so in order for us to rewrite this in a new way, we can think about this as a fraction. How do I add two fractions? Well, if I want to add two fractions, I need to uh, find the uh, lowest common denominator, right? The lowest common denominator in this term or in any any case you're adding two fractions and you have one of them is over one, the lowest common denominator is gonna be the denominator of the other fraction you're trying to add it to, right? So whenever you have something over one and you're trying to find the LCD or lowest common denominator to make the denominators the same thing, it's always gonna be the, the, the value of the other one. So here we're gonna have one over two X plus one plus five times two X plus one divided by one times two X plus one. And what this is going to do is it's going to give us 1 over 2x plus 1 plus 5 times 2x plus 1 over 2x plus 1. Now that these two have the same denominator, we can actually add them. So here we have 1 plus 5 times 2x plus 1 over 2x plus 1. This is the only way that we can find an equivalent expression because the only thing left for us to do uh, when evaluating this is literally just to add them. This is the only, only thing only option that we have left, right? So now we could just simplify this, right? What's five times two X? That five times two X is 10 X and five times one is five, right? So here we have six plus 10 X over two X plus one. Uh, so which choice uh, says that? Or we can have 10 X plus six over two X plus one, commutative property of addition. We could just move this around. So 10 X plus six over two over X plus one is choice D, I think, yep. All right, so moving on to number 13, it says which of the function, uh, which the graph of the function f in the xy plane is uh, is a parabola, which of the following defines f. Uh, if you're looking at this, you should know, and it gives you us the vertex, you should be thinking of the, of the very specific formula. Uh, I'll write this in a nice color. Uh, y is equal to a times x uh, minus h plus k, right? This is the uh, uh, vertex form. So whenever they give you the point of a vertex or, or we, and the point of a vertex is just the coordinates of the tip of a parabola. You should be thinking about that form, right? And what this form says is uh, H is the X value and K is the Y value of the, uh, of the vertex, right? So let's just find the, the, the graph the equation for this. We're going to have Y is equal to a times X minus three, right? Because minus H, H is our X value of the parabola plus k, which is one, so plus one, right? So this is going to be the equation, right? So automatically we could eliminate choice D and we could eliminate choice B because they have plus three, right? 
now we just have to find what A is. And the best way to find out what A is is just to plug in points, right? So here they give us the point 5 and 4. So 5 is equal to A times. We know that when Y is 5, A, uh, X is 4. So 4 minus 3 plus 1. So 5 is equal to 4, mi 4 minus 3 is 1. So A plus 1, A has to equal to 4, right? If we subtract 1 on both sides, we have 4 is equal to A. So our A value has to equal to 4, and that means our answer has to be A, right? So now we have a system of inequalities or something like that. And it says, in which of the following does a shaded region represent a solution set in the XY plane to the system of inequalities below, right? So uh, notice something here that these lines are the exact same. They have the same point of intersection. They have the same slope. This is pretty much the same line, right? The only thing that's changing here is what's being shaded, all right? So you just need to figure out uh, which way uh, you need to shade, right? So uh, right here, we know that whatever line is going upwards is going to correspond to this, right? Because the slope is positive. So the thing that I'm drawing in the blue is going to be the top equation. Be the top equation. We know that whenever uh, anything, whenever y is greater than anything, we're going to have to shade up, right? our solution is going to have to shade is going to be above the line, right? So the shaded part uh, is going to have to be above the line, right? So whenever we graph it and there's an inequality, we're always going to have to shade either above or below. When we're dealing with something that is greater than y, when y is the greatest thing, when it's pointing to y, when anything is pointing to y, we're going to have to shade up because y is up. So if we shade up, we realize that choice A is wrong. And if we shade up, we realize that choice D is wrong, right? Because the solution set is actually below this blue line. So now we're left with C and, uh, and we're left with B, right? So uh, here we're, de we're dealing with this, right? So we have 2x plus 3y is greater than or equal to 6. Uh, we can't really do anything with this form, so I would convert it into y equals mx plus b, right? Because this was in y equals mx plus b, and we'll deal with that. We'll deal with it that way. So here we have 2x. I'm going to subtract 6 on both sides. And it's going to be greater than or equal to, and I'm going to subtract 3 on both sides. So it's greater than or equal to y, right? So now I'm going to divide by negative 3. I have negative 2 thirds x plus 2 is greater than or equal to y. Notice how I, uh, I flipped the sign because I'm, I'm dividing by a negative number. That's a rule you need to remember. So here, our, the slope of our line is negative, right? So it's going to be facing down. Our, our, our line is going to be this x, right? And notice how our y is less than, right? So in this case, our y was greater than and we shaded it up. Now our y is, is, is less than, right? And whenever y is less than, whenever something is greater than y, we have to shade down. It's the opposite of this. We have to shade down. So here we're going to be shading down. And over here, we're going to have to be shading down, right? So choice C is wrong because our solution set is actually above this line, uh, uh, which is wrong because we need to be shading down. So choice B is the only correct answer. Remember that when y is greater than, when, when it's facing towards the y, we shade up. When it's toward, facing away from the y, we shade down because it's sad. Here we shade up because we're happy because we're looking at the y. Here we're sad and we go down because we're no, we're no longer looking at the y, right? So with this graph, we shade it up. With this graph, we shade it down. And, they're in, they, and they both intersect at this shaded region right here, which is the solution. Moving on to 15, it says, uh, what is the set of all solutions in the equation? Uh, there's going to be no set of solutions because why? Well, uh, think about it. Uh, you cannot have uh, a square root or actually, whoa, 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 almost, almost tricked myself into choosing the, uh, the wrong answer here. Um, <clears throat> there's only one answer that can actually uh, uh, do this. And that's a, a, a negative number. It's going to be negative one, right? I, what I was going to say is, uh, this can uh, a, a square root can never be equal to a negative number, uh, unless of course we're dealing with a negative expo uh, a, a negative variable, right? Because this negative one could be negative times negative one. X could be a negative number, and that would make this a positive. Now, if this was saying that uh, x pl radical x plus two is equal to negative one, then there would be no solutions. But because it's equal to a negative variable, there's there still could be a solution so long as this is negative, and in this case, it's true, right? So. Knowing that, let's just let's just plug in values to make sure we're extra sure. So radical x plus two. Let's plug in negative one. Right, negative one is going to be radical negative one plus two is equal to negative one times negative one. So radical one is equal to one. Is that true? Yes. 
right? So let's try two. Radical x plus two is equal to negative one times two. Radical two plus two is equal to negative two. Is radical four equal to negative two? Wrong. Radical four is equal to two, right? So two doesn't make sense. One is the only one that, that works here. Moving on to uh, number 16, it says, what is the volume in cubic centimeters of a right rectangular prism that has a length of four centimeters, a width of nine centimeters, and a height of 10 centimeters? Whenever we're dealing with vol volume, V is equal to L times W times H, right? So here, our length is four, our width is nine, and our height is 10. Four times nine is 36, and 36 times 10 is 360. That's our answer. Uh, it's asking us what, what X satisfies the equation above. Uh, what is the value of 2x plus 1? So if here we have 4x plus 2 is equal to 4, 2x plus 1 is just half of this. So divide this by 2, you get 2x plus 1 is equal to 4 divided by 2, which is just 2. You should notice that this is half of this and just divide everything by 2. Uh, number 18 says the figure above shows the complete graph of the function f in the xy plane. The function g, not shown, is defined by f of x plus 6. What is the maximum value of the function g? Whenever you have f of x, right, and then space 6, uh, on, on the outside, that just means that we're adding six to every single y value. So g of x is just every y value of f of x plus six, right? Uh, so if if the max and it's asking us what's the maximum value of the function of g. So if if g of x is just every y value of f of x plus six. That means that the maximum value of g is going to be the maximum value of f plus 6. So the maximum value of f is 2. 2 plus 6 is 8. 8 is your answer, right? Notice that uh, whenever you just whenever you add 6 to f of x, or whenever you add a number to a graph, y plus 6 or, or f of g plus 6, whatever, whenever you add a, a number to the outside of, a, of, of something that's supposed to represent a function, you're just adding 6 to all the y values. Right now, if this was f of x plus uh, f of x plus six, this would be something else. Now you're adding six to all of the x values. But whenever it's on the outside of the parentheses, know that you're adding that value to all of the y values. That's all you need to know. Moving on to number nineteen, it says triangle PQR is a right angle Q. If sine r is equal to four over five, what is the value of tan p? So let's just draw this triangle out. We know that it's uh, we have a right angle at Q, so here's going to be Q. I'm just going to say that this is p. So, oh. Dyslexia. Anyways, so here's P, so P, Q, and R. This is our triangle. We know that the sine of R, so the sine of R is equal to 4 over 5. How do we know this? Because we know so, ka, toa. So sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. So if, um, if sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, that means that the opposite, the side opposite R, which is the side across from it, the side that R is looking at has to be four, right? Because this is opposite, and the hypotenuse, which is the side across from the right, the right angle, has to be five, right? So here we have four, here we have five, and it's asking us for the tan, the the tangent of P, right? So we know that the tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. Uh, we know this is a three, four, five triangle because that's just a triangle that exists. Uh, the tangent of P has to equal to opposite over adjacent. The side that is opposite of, of P is going to be 3. And the side adjacent to it, the side that P is actually touching, that it shares a border with, is going to be 4. Right, So this is going to equal to 3 fourths. Moving on to number 20 in the last question in this section, it says the graph of the linear function F not shown in the xy plane above. Uh, cool. The graph of the linear function G not shown is perpendicular to the graph F and it passes through point 1, comma 3. What is the value of G of 0? Beautiful. So it tells us that we have this graph right here, f, and it also tells that we have another graph that's perpendicular to it. So in order to find any point on that graph, we need to first figure out the equation of that graph, right? And whenever we're dealing with something perpendicular, there's a formula we can use uh, to find the slope of the perpendicular line. But before we worry about that, let's just find the slope of the regular line given. We can tell slope from a graph by just looking at rise over run. So he, or rather, we, we can just do uh, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? So let's just pick a point here uh, and here, right? So here we have uh, 0, 3, and here we have uh, 1, 1. So here we have uh, 3, uh, sorry about that. Here we have uh, 1 minus 3 over 1 minus 0. So the slope is going to be negative 2 over 1. Uh, my application is frozen. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm going to have to wait a... Uh, 
wait a minute for it to, to react. Hello. All right. Beautiful. I think we're up and running. Yep. So it's going to be equal to negative two over one. So the slope here is negative two. Now the slope of a perpendicular line is going to equal to the slope. So slope of perp is equal to uh, negative one over m, right? So when two slopes are perpendicular, right, they form a 90 degree angle. And you could always find the slope of the perpendicular line by just dividing the slope of the other line by one and negating it, right? So the slope of the perpendicular line is going to be negative one over negative two. So it's just going to be negative, it's just going to be positive one half, right? So you can imagine positive one half line going up through here, right? Imagine that's the slope and you could see that it forms a 90 degree angle. All right. So now we know that the slope of, we know the slope of that line. We know that, that the formula for that, for that line is now going to be equal to Y equals, uh, Neg uh, positive one half plus b, right? And now we just need to solve for its y-intercept, right? So we know that it passes through point one comma three. So in order to solve for b, let's just plug in that point. So we have y equals one half x plus b. So we know that three is equal to one half plus b. We know that b is equal to two point five if we subtract this one half from the other side. So now we know the equation of the line is equal to y is equal to one half x plus two point five, right? It's asking us for uh, g of zero. So it's asking us for the y value when x is zero. So one half times zero is zero. So y is equal to two point five. So the answer here is going to be two point five. Right. So that's all the questions uh, completed as I would do it if I was on a test. Obviously, this would be a lot faster. Uh, if I didn't have to explain it, right? But this is the fastest I can explain it. This is how you should be looking at these problems and solving them. If you have any questions or if you have any suggestions on how to do this quicker, please leave them in the comments. If you want more of these videos, let me know in the comments. And if you like what you saw, please subscribe because it does help. Goodbye.